um, well, uh, team is still sponsor for the uh, Zoom, uh, which is really nice. So thank them. And if you are looking for opportunities, uh, feel free to contact them. All right, the Pac-Man rule. Although we are not, like we're pretty much all isolated, uh, it's important that when we are back in social, uh, we should stand in as a group people but always leave a room for one person to join the group. It's a very good rule to social and uh, you can have, you can get to know more people. Today's talk, we're gonna have Isaac events presenting the good to the last drop, writing robotics flask apps. And this talk is actually from PyCon. And uh, we have uh, Ravni and Ant presenting the RESTful web APIs with Spaz API later. Um, so the upcoming events. Well, at this very time, we don't have many. The Polyglot YEG is still, um, well, we don't have a time for that yet. And uh, I'll keep it updated. The priority dev call is moved to September 15th, uh, 14th and 15th. It was like March something, but it was, uh, the date was moved. The PyCon US is canceled. Um, however, the organizing teams are making their best effort to put all the slides online and maybe having an online one. So um, I will keep you guys tuned. Um, the news. Well, last Python 2.7 maintenance release is on April, which is this month. And we just had the very last release, which is 2.7.18. So after this firewall 2.7, and uh, if you haven't upgraded that, please do so, or you have to maintain it yourself. The Python 3.9 uh, Alpha 5 is available for testing and general 3.0.5 is available. Uh, the Python community also has a new sponsorship program for Python package. So if you would like to make a new Python package, you should check it out. The reading for the month. So the first article, um, how to write good Python, a good quality Python code with GitHub Actions. For those who don't know, GitHub Actions is a new feature it's like very similar to CI/CD, but it's a little bit a little bit different. The um, this article is for beginners, but it introduces a lot of like um, different packages and a step-by-step -step tutorial of how to set up this GitHub Actions. It's it's pretty good to look at. The second one is introduction to ASGI, which is async Python web uh, server. So this article give a gives a great introduction to the ASCII uh, from basic to living examples. So for example, how would you write a async um, server wrapper around your functions and around your servers, uh, for example. And um, it includes a lot of useful packages and products. So a lot of resources link. And the last is the advantage use of Python request. So Python request library, if it, if you are into um, you know uh, web development or like web crawlers, uh, chances are you're going to use this a lot. And this article actually shows detailed examples of the uh, uh, how to make hooks using requests and various setups for like for example base URL and more to reduce repet repetitive codes, and also comparing the retries and debugging. It's very useful. All right, so um, here are some really nice links. The first one is a code bit, 19 hackathon. I've mentioned this during the last meetup. So it's a hackathon that is um, strictly about the um, COVID-19, but like people are uh, uh, teaming up and make projects about it. So for example, visualization, prediction, whatever. And uh, it's been for a month and they're looking for judges. So if you're interested, I'm not sure if you can still participate, but if you are interested in judging or just looking around, feel free to check it out. The second one, the third one are the AB and the Canada uh, COVID stats. So they, there are lots of important information there. Uh, just feel free to take a look. And our next Python meetup is May 27th. So uh, mark your calendar and if you can attend it, that's great.
um, we're always looking for sponsorships and um, uh, uh, speakers. So especially at this very time, uh, it's it's a little bit difficult to you know communicate face to face. So if you're interested in uh, giving a talk or an like sponsor event in the future, that's very appreciated. So you can either talk to me or Rich Allen, our uh, co organizer. And um, uh, well, I'll see you guys next time. So let's welcome uh, who's going to present first? Yes, Isaac uh, to present first. Hey everybody, uh, thanks so much for the introduction, Carson, and for the invitation to speak. Really excited to uh, share with you guys what um, you know would have been uh, presented at PyCon, but now is not. So I'm gonna turn off my video while I do the share screen, just to make sure that everything comes through smoothly. I just wanted to make a quick announcement, sorry. Isaac, just uh, sorry to interrupt, but just so everyone knows, we're yeah. just recording this session and we'll make that available after. Uh, but just so everyone's aware, it's just being uh, recorded. Yep. Great. Well, welcome everybody. This is good to the last drop, writing robust Flask applications. Um, I've been doing a lot of Zoom presentations lately, so feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, there are some natural pause points in the presentation where uh, you can use either the Q&A feature in Zoom uh, or the other things, and we can either do it uh, as you go through or if you have questions and you wanna hold them to the end. Either way works for me. Um, and I thought I might start off by just giving you a little bit of background and motivation uh, for the question. So why does a Flask app need to be robust anyways? Um, and I think I have a little bit of a unique perspective here because I spent a couple of years in the government working on what you would call offensive cyber, but is basically a large criminal organization that the US government uh, considers legitimate because it's the government running it. And the, the answer to this question of why your Flask app needs to be robust, unfortunately, is that it's a lot of fun to be a criminal uh, and breaking into other people's web applications uh, is not only sometimes easier than it ought to be, but highly entertaining. So you won't find necessarily that many applications or presentations in the Python world written by people who have been on the other side of the offense defense spectrum. So uh, I'm hoping to just give a little bit of insight into as somebody who very pragmatically has seen things from that side, what are the things that you can do to protect yourself? And it's not just me uh, doing the work, but uh, in fact, I'm representing a whole team. So we've got people from security teams at places like Google, Facebook, NCC Group, uh, and RIA. And our work is really about trying to figure out how can we help automate security for developers. So as part of that, we release a lot of open source tools and then we provide commercial services and support for enterprise on top of those tools. Uh, two of them that are open source we'll be mentioning tonight along with a whole bunch of other tools that you can use to try to automate uh, security inside your development process. So without further ado, uh, this, app, this presentation is gonna touch on both Flask and Django. Uh, but Flask is a little bit simpler. So for the sake of a lot of the examples, they'll be in Flask just because it tends to be very concise. A lot of the libraries that we're gonna talk about though are used uh, in common between the two applications. So here is of course the most basic Flask application that you can imagine. If you've ever used Flask or a similar you know, small framework, you've probably seen something like this. We've got a run declaration at the end. We're using a decorator to say what the route for this function is. And then we're just returning a very basic string. Uh, obviously, of course, we'd want this to be HTML. And the question that we're gonna be answering tonight is, all right, when I run Python app.py and then put it on the internet for anyone in the world to access, how do I know whether or not that is secure? And you know, what would somebody from a very uh, you know, pragmatic attacker's point of view be doing in the first place to try to break into the application? So to understand this question, we're gonna look at a couple different layers. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna need to, underdo is, to do is understand the stack. So when we invoke Python app.py, it's not just app.py that's involved, there's Python, there's the operating system, there are layers below that. Some of those are especially relevant, so we're gonna dig into them. Then we're gonna talk about, if you're going to be attacked, it's helpful to understand, okay, what are the possible ways in which we could be vulnerable? So. There are a bunch of uh, frameworks that people have built up over the years, which are basically going to give us an ontology of vulnerabilities. And uh, we're gonna spend a tiny bit of time talking about risk versus impact uh, in terms of how we prioritize those vulnerabilities. But then uh, the last main chunk of the presentation will be, okay, well, what tools can we use to automatically check 
security and correctness as we're writing the application. So the, the first bit uh, that we're going to jump straight into is understanding the stack. And this might be a little bit of review uh, for some of you, but I mean, the good news here is that we use Python. So we're automatically immune to a lot of attacks. And in particular, a lot of the worst sorts of attacks like heap stack uh, overflows that have resulted in uh, you know, the many, many vulnerabilities that have plagued C and C++ programs, especially. We're also immune to most kinds of memory disclosure. So if you're familiar with the Heartbleed bug, uh, or if you want to uh, refresh your memory, the XKCD on Heartbleed is an excellent uh, reminder. It's probably too small for you to read it, but if you Google XKCD Heartbleed, it'll come right up. So um, there are some caveats here, though. You know, Python is a memory safe language, um, but memory leaks are still memory safe. So if you've ever uh, you know, used maybe a machine learning framework or any kind of data, big data framework inside Python, it is actually possible for that framework to have a bug, which will just allocate gigabytes and gigabytes of memory and never release them. Uh, so just because we have a memory safe language, we're not necessarily free from that. And then also, you know, just because a module is a Python module doesn't mean that it might not have some sharp edges underneath. So, you know, in fact, many Python modules that you've interacted with, for example, NumPy, if you've ever noticed during the installation process, they're doing a lot of invocation of a C or C++ compiler. They're, in fact, mostly written in C, just with Python bindings on top of that C. And that means that you can sometimes have these unexpected sharp edges. So, for instance, you would think that it's impossible to allocate uninitialized memory in Python, uh, as happens during the Heartbleed vulnerability. But in fact, it is possible to do that. And if you are using NumPy and you have NumPy.empty, that's going to give you an uninitialized block of memory, which could contain any sort of sensitive secret from the server. So it's unlikely that you know, your NumPy application would be running via Flask. But if it is, it is possible to have some sorts of these vulnerabilities, just unlikely. So if we, if we dig down into the stack specifically, uh, we've got a couple different layers. And obviously, this is a simplification. But we've got our app.py, so you know, our web server. And then that's sitting on top of a lot of built-in or third-party libraries, which is where your Flask or Django would come in. But the next step, um, you know, if you're new to Python, you may not realize this. Python is just a language. But you need to have a program which is capable of interpreting your app.py file and actually running it. So there's a specific implementation of the Python language which you've installed on your machine uh, or it was installed for you. The default implementation which most people are using is called CPython, uh, although there are others like PyPy. And then CPython is actually, as its name suggests, pretty much mostly written in C. It's linking against a standard library on most Linuxes that would be something like libc on a system like Alpine, if you're using it for minimal Docker images, for instance, it would be Muscle. If you're running on Windows, it would be something called CRT. And then below that is the operating system. So the, the good news here is that everything I've outlined in red, uh, you're not really responsible for the security properties of these components of the stack. There's somebody else's responsibility. Uh, it's really your job to just kind of keep up to date, because people are going to find a lot of vulnerabilities inside these. So for instance, here is a uh, abbreviated list of actually a bunch of the vulnerabilities that have been found in uh, the Python core. Actually, one of the uh, top ones here from 2020 was from our company. R2C actually found a vulnerability in the Python core that got categorized as a high severity CDE back in January. Um, so these things come through, you know, like not like every day, but at a pretty frequent place. And so it's your responsibility to figure out, hey, how do I stay up to date with these sorts of things? So that leads us into some uh, you know, dilemmas, right? This is the classic uh, security person advice. Hey, your software is out of date. Would you like to spend the rest of your natural life trying to figure out how to upgrade it? Or would you like to let hackers steal your identity, drain your bank accounts, and destroy your hard drive? Uh, if you're looking for some better recommendations, uh, in fact, I think there are some big improvements that have been coming out in the Python community specifically with how to stay up to date. So the first one I would recommend is Update third-party libraries and do that with something like pipinv or poetry. So if you're not familiar with these, you probably have heard of a requirements.txt file, which is where you list the dependencies that somebody needs to pip install in order to have a working dependency environment for your application. Pipinv and poetry are both upgrades to the requirements.txt workflow. 
So there's now officially support uh, as part of the Python spec for something called the pip file and the pip file.lock, which is what both poetry and pip and use. The, the really the, the takeaway here is if you switch to using these package managers, you automatically, you know, you can just type one command to update and it'll automatically update all of your dependencies to the latest version, which is great. The other thing from a security perspective, which is pretty cool, is that this lock file, you know, like if you have a requirements.txt, you're specifying, hey, I need this dependency at this version, but you're not specifying, and then that dependency might have its own dependencies, and I want exactly this version and exactly this version of those, all the way down through that transitive dependency tree. The pip file.lock is familiar to a package lock.json or a yarn lock.json if you're familiar with the JavaScript ecosystem. And it makes you more confident that you know, your dependencies aren't changing underneath you, or if you installed it on your machine and then somebody else installed it on their machine, you don't have different dependencies because the lock file specifies not only every version of every dependency, including the transitive dependencies in an absolute fashion, it also embeds checksums and SHA hashes of the you know, like files that you expect to get from the remote server. So it's a great way to make sure that your application is reproducible in terms of the dependencies as well as more secure. So that was, that was uh, you know, the second layer. The third layer, Python itself. Um, you know, I'm not actually sure if there's a mailing list you can subscribe to that just reports security Python updates. Uh, but an easy thing that you can do right now is go to the Python implementation that you're using on GitHub and select the notification for uh, be notified of new Python releases. Uh, I thought it was cool how at the start of the meetup, uh, you know, it was already mentioned, oh yeah, there's a, uh, a new, you know, made minor release of Python 2.7, which will apparently be the last one, I think, coming out. Um, and then updating your operating system base image, that's kind of obvious. Most of us have probably been pretty familiar with that. This is a lot of updating. Um, so, you know, if you need a security service that can give you prioritization, GitHub now for free offers a security alerting service. And then there are other commercial services like snick.io uh, and pyup.io, which focus more on the, uh, you know, third party dependencies from a place like PyPy. How are you, which ones are actually security updates that you need to take? So yeah, any, any questions on, um, you know, this, this set of recommendations, maybe this seems really obvious, but in terms of bang for the buck, keeping up to date with security vulnerabilities is really, really valuable because if somebody is going to attack you, they're going to look for, you know, like an already discovered vulnerability that they can leverage before they do anything novel that might be unique to your application. So I actually have a question. Uh, yeah. Which one do you prefer, the Pipan or Poetry? Hmm. Good question. I, it, I feel like it's really more a matter of preference. Poetry is newer. It's, it's less popular by virtue of being newer. It seems better designed to me, um, but you know, Pippin is very popular or at least like in a relative sense. So I feel like the ergonomics and friendliness of poetry is better, um, but it's a personal preference. I see. So although Pippin is like been there for years, but there are still many packages that are, that are not there. So what do you do with that situation? Or it's like not compatible with many packages? Um, well, I mean, I guess Pippin is just a wrapper around pip. Um, so are you referring to packages that like aren't on the registry uh, or not pip installable? I mean, most of the, well, there are times that the, uh, the pip file dot lock wouldn't lock a specific version or there's conflict there or there's uh, compatibility yeah. issues, so. Right, right. Well, that's, that's, that's certainly true. I mean, like, I think what you're referring to is like when you have uh, version A, which installs a dependency and then that dependency is incompatible with another dependency at the transitive level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, unfortunately, neither of these uh, can like fix that for you. Poetry mm -hmm. might have slightly better error messages so that you can understand it. But yeah, that's a that's a maintainer problem, and it's it's ugly. Cool. So uh, there's another question from the uh, the audience. So yeah. for OS based image, is that for something we have on cloud? Um, so yeah, I guess I'm thinking about it when I say base image. Uh, you know, if you have a Docker file, that's kind of the root of the Docker file, but that's like your Ubuntu uh, or your Alpine. It could be a VM. 
it, you know, it might be on the bare metal. If you're using a service uh, like Heroku, for instance, uh, or, you know, like, um, what's the new one from Amazon, a AWS Lambda, the trend has been to avoid uh, you even having to think about the operating system, right? Like when you deploy to Heroku or you deploy an AWS Lambda, they're automatically updating the base operating system for you, as well as typically they're updating Python for you. So you just don't have to think about it. That's great. The fewer things that you have to think about from a security perspective, the better. Great. So um, Brad asked a question that are pipenv or poetry a similar idea to pip? Uh, yes. So what's going on with both of those tools is that they are wrappers around pip. Um, they're basically managing your pip environment for you. Um, you know, so pipenv is explicitly creating virtual ends under the hood. Uh, and basically the idea is rather than mucking with your global Python environment and like installing this package everywhere, uh, which is what, uh, you know, like a pip would do uh, even with the user flag, right? Like it's installing it for your entire, for your user on every project. Um, it is setting up an environment that is specific just for this project. Uh, this is what our dependencies look like. And then when I move into that environment, I can, you know, uh, import the modules that have been specified as dependencies. But if I'm in a different project, there's no crossover between the two. Thanks. So uh, Liz is asking for Python updates. Is subscribing to release free? Would I find out about new updates automatically? So basically subscribing, well, uh, it, it's there. I, I don't really find there's a sub subscribing, but if there is one, it's free. And if you uh, type in Python news in your browser, it, the first one should be the Python uh, release log. And um, do you have any add-ons to, uh, if there's any way to get the new updates automatically? Um, so, you know, usually the, the Python updates are also shipped through your, your distribution manager, right? So if I, you're on Ubuntu and you do an apt-get update, uh, you know, and then uh, an apt-get upgrade, uh, that the minor versions of Python are automatically coming through that. It's, it's more of, you know, knowing that, oh, there's a security fix inside this version of Python uh, that I definitely need to take that, uh, you know, you might want to cap, catch there. Thanks. So uh, actually, in addition, uh, you don't have to update Python very frequently. So the minor versions, you can update them and you can, well, you can just choose stable versions to your best needs, but it's recommended that you update to the latest version. For sure. Right. And, and, and the Python folks do a good job of, you know, like, even if you're on an older version of Python, as long as you're keeping that older version up to date, they will backport security fixes. Of course, the big caveat here being that, you know, Python 2.7 is not getting official security fixes anymore. Exactly. <laughs> right. right. All right. Uh, so Christian is actually asking, uh, for the tax stack, how can app.py interact with these other components? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm actually going to just keep going in the presentation because that's the next thing that we're going to talk about. Um, so this is the this is the next part, um, right? The part that's actually our responsibility, which is the app.py that we wrote and how it interacts with those libraries. Um, you know, although technically your app.py could interact with the like deeper parts of the operating system, that's pretty unusual. Really, it's just the like imported modules and how you're using Flask and Django that is going to be the, uh, the important part. So that's what we're gonna get into next. So it's a four part presentation, just finished part one. And now the second part is going to be this ontology of vulnerabilities. So this is the part we're responsible for. We have to understand, okay, like here are the possible ways in which somebody could attack our application. Um, and fortunately for us, there are a lot of people who have put together ontologies of what sorts of vulnerabilities can be inside a web app. The one that we're going to use tonight is from the Open Web Application Security Project, also known as OWASP, which is a lot shorter, for, called the OWASP Top 10. Uh, and there's some other really good ones. Uh, MITRE CWE is one that's used by you know, all the heavily regulated industries. If you've heard of a CVE, which is a common vulnerability enumeration, CWE is a common weaknesses enumeration. And basically, every CVE corresponds to a weakness that allowed that vulnerability to exist in the first place. So um, there's going to be a lot of information, but in terms of how you think about this pragmatically, 
my guiding philosophy is basically having a short wall that goes all the way around what you're trying to protect is better than having a really tall gatehouse, which is to say being consistent is more important than being really impressive or doing something clever from a security perspective. And I, I think this actually ties into the Zen of Python uh, in that, you know, in security as well, simple is better than complicated. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to do my best to, you know, like take these things which are pretty common uh, ways in which applications are attacked and make them very clear and easy to understand. But I'll also call out the ways in which frameworks like Flask and Django make it hard to be secure uh, and make it not the simple and easy path. So this is the OWASP top 10 that I just mentioned. Um, we're not gonna have time to talk about all of them today. So I've put in bold the ones that I'm actually going to discuss. And I'm gonna try to do a good job of just giving you a sense for um, you know, the things that are non-intuitive or tricky. Um, just, to, just to do a quick check on the time, uh, are you, because uh, I know there was some intro at the start. Should I aim for um, ending on the half hour or at the 40 minute mark? What do you think? Feel free to take whatever you need. Okay, sounds good. Because um, some of these are easier to skip over than others. But you know, in, in terms of your understanding, you, probably everybody has a pretty good intuitive idea of like, oh, broken authentication, sensitive data exposure. You know, broken authentication is you didn't check the password properly, which sounds ridiculous, but <laughs> Dropbox had that happen to them a couple of years ago, which was great. So let's, let's dig into the first one, which is injection. In fact, even in injection, there are a whole bunch of different types of injection. So SQL injection is probably the one, if you've heard about this before, that came to your mind. But there are a bunch of other different forms. So let's start with SQL injection. And I'm going to give you just a few seconds to digest this extension to our app.py file. So we've got a route, uh, which is doing a search. We're getting from the user the queue parameter, and we're putting that into a SQL query. Uh, and then we are executing that SQL query on our database. So um, you know, what's, what's the problem here? If you've heard about SQL injection in the past, you're probably like, ah, I know exactly what the problem is. But I would, I would draw your mind to how innocent and simple this snippet looks. Um, you know, this is exactly the sort of thing that you would see in a Stack Overflow answer or, answer or in a, um, you know, like a book about using Flask. And it wouldn't be until much later in that book that they're like, yeah, actually, if you do this in an app and then you put it on the internet, it's a great way to get hacked. Uh, and it's because of the subtlety of SQL injection, I think that it's just such a common way uh, that people get exploited. So the vulnerability here, uh, if you didn't already spot it, is this Q parameter comes from the browser. So what if the browser, the user, puts in apostrophe space or space one equals one? Well, then the database is going to see select star from some table where title like empty string or one equals one, which uh, in case you're not super familiar with SQL, this is basically instead of only returning a couple rows from the database, going to return all the rows in the database. And in fact, uh, we could have chained a whole nother SQL query here. We could have put like semicolon, uh, delete from some table without any qualification and just erased all of the data in the database or used it to, you know, if this was querying a user's table, we could suddenly bypass all of the authentication that's supposed to only look up and return a user if this username and password matches. Um, so from an attacker's perspective, this is just great because it is so easy to make this mistake inside your application and then it's so easy to exploit it. Um, but uh, since we're talking about how we can protect ourselves against this, uh, it's our job to figure out how to take these gotchas uh, which exist inside all of these frameworks and figure out some actionable recommendations. So the first one, um, which might seem you know, like a little simplistic, but is just don't use SQL. Uh, use an ORM, an object relational mapper, like uh, SQL Alchemy, for instance. And so in that world, we're never constructing any kind of SQL queries. We've got an object, like the user object, we say user.get, request.querid, and this is totally safe. Uh, the ORM handles, it has a few exceptions and sharp edges, but like 99% of the time, the way that people use an ORM is going to be totally fine. So that's great, that's an excellent solution. The second one is maybe if you've heard security people talk about this before, what you expected me to say, and that's, oh, you need to sanitize your input, don't trust user input. I actually think this is kind of bad advice uh, for two reasons. The first one is a little bit technical. 
it's kind of hard to guarantee that the sanitization function matches the parser in the database uh, exactly. So imagine you upgrade your database and all of a sudden it supports some new syntax. You would have to remember to upgrade every you know, function that you use to do sanitization in order to make the application still safe. And maybe that sounds like it would never happen. I guarantee you it happens all the time. And then the other thing is you have to remember to do it everywhere. So every possible user input that flows to any possible database input has to have this sanitization function, which is just kind of a giant pain. So the third recommendation um, is to maintain the separation between code and data. And if you, if you understand this, you really are well on your way to avoiding injection vulnerabilities inside your application. Um, what, what you're doing here is using parameterized queries. So even though it looks like the snippet of code in number three is very similar to what we just saw on the previous slide, in fact, it's very, very different underneath. Uh, and the clearest way I can say this is that although it looks like string concatenation is happening here on the client side and then the full query is going to the database, in example number three, it's actually as if there's almost two separate packets, one with this SQL query, which is highlighted, and the other with the data from the user. So that distinction, the separation between the code plane and the data plane is maintained all the way to the database. They're never mixed. And then the database can continue that separation rather than having to parse it out separately. Um, so this is great. And in fact, like if you work at a place like Google, Google has a compiler plugin for most of their languages that will just force you to use the parameterized query API. Um, I think it's kind of unfortunate that a lot of the SQL libraries make it look like the parameterized query is just like string concatenation. That's definitely not what's going on here. And then, uh, you know, the, the last bit of advice is, well, okay, whatever you're doing, you really want to automatically enforce uh, one of these options, right? Because if you're just relying on people to remember uh, to do these things, you're probably going to have a bad time, which is why, uh, you know, like as mentioned in the Google case, along with a lot of other very security conscious places, they'll provide some ways to automatically enforce one of these recommendations. Uh, so one of the open source tools, which we'll talk about later that RTC has released called Bento has some ways to enforce uh, number three in particular, and it's as easy as uh, pip installing it. But we'll come back to that at the end of the presentation when we go over all of the options for automatic enforcement. So I, I promised that there was more to injection than just SQL injection. Here's a very Flask specific example of what we would call template injection. So in this case, Similar thing, we've got a app.route decorator, we've got our error function, um, we've got a template string that's you know, created inside the function here, and then we're calling return render template string, uh, which is going to do some operations on our template and then put in the referrer uh, so that the user can go back to you know, the URL that they came from. So I'll give you a few more seconds to kind of grok that and think about what the problem might be. Um, and this is, this is subtle, so if you're not super familiar with Flask, you may not know it offhand. But here's an example of us creating a request and we're, we're using Postman to construct the referrer. Yes, so somebody in the comments has it. The referrer can be anything. What if the referrer looks like bracket, you know, curly bracket, curly bracket, seven times seven? Well, the page is going to render the evaluated result of seven times seven, which is 49. So that may seem harmless, but what if instead of seven times seven, I put in config. Now the config from the server, which could have all sorts of sensitive secrets or things like that, will suddenly be displayed to the user. So that's not great. Um, you know, here's another example of a security gotcha. And here the, the fix is actually pretty simple. Don't use render template sing, string. Uh, instead, use the much safer render template. Um, and then, automatically enforce this. So actually later on in the presentation, we're gonna walk through exactly how an automatic enforcement for this could look. Uh, we're gonna manually create a uh, commit hook, which would automatically enforce this inside your application. So the third injection type that we're gonna cover is CSV injection. This one's a little more esoteric. Uh, it may not be a problem for your application, but it's pretty interesting. So if we look at this, we've got another route slash get CSV We've got a function which is opening up a file name, getting the file name for the user, opening up that file name, and then returning a response, uh, sending this CSV data back to the user. So again, 
if you're familiar with CSV injection or you've heard about this, you're probably like, ah, I know exactly what the problem is. Otherwise, this might seem totally straightforward and very fine. Probably if you've written a web app, you've had something similar to this to let the user download some data. And in fact, this is exploiting uh, a quirk that exists both in Microsoft Office and in OpenOffice, where if that CSV looks like this box up above, so we've got name, date of birth, address, John Doe, some date of birth, and then equals command pipe apostrophe space forward slash C calc. Uh, if the CSV file looks like this, when it loads up, Excel is going to present a dialog box to the user that looks like this. Uh, and it's basically going to say, hey, do not enable this content unless you trust the source of this file. But the catch is that the user just downloaded this file from your website, not from, you know, they didn't get it in an email or go to some sketchy third party website. So they, they do trust the source of this file. Uh, and so they're likely to say enable. But if they're, you know, like downloading a row of data and somebody else entered their address corresponding to this field, it's going to execute arbitrary code on their machine. So in this case, it's just going to pop open a calculator. Uh, in the security community, popping open a calculator is a common sort of, um, it's, it's just what people do when to prove that they could run any command on your computer, <laughs> they'll pop open the calculator. Uh, so this is, this is a really interesting one. It's very surprising and unexpected, right? And it also might not be an issue for your application, right? Like maybe for what you're doing, if the user chooses to click enable on this box, that's like totally their fault and not something that you would be concerned about. But it illustrates the importance of having a really good threat model for understanding, hey, if I'm shipping this data off to this other application and I think that the user is going to trust it coming from my application, what does that imply about, you know, am I responsible for the security properties of what happens after the fact? Um, any questions? So the, the recommendation, well, right after this, I'll pause for some questions, but fortunately this one is pretty easy to fix. Basically, you just want to explicitly escape any data that flows to a CSV using either single or double quotes. Here's an example of how you could do that with the uh, CSV module, which is a Python built-in. And then as mentioned, uh, you know, you just need to understand the security implications of like, oh, like is this, is this something, you know, it might not be CSV, it might be uh, like some other file type that you're letting the users download. And understanding the security implications of that is super valuable. So any, any questions on the injection side of things? Yeah, unfortunately I can't see the like Q&A thing uh, from the presenter view. I can see the regular chat. Um, so I can see- uh, Nothing, more, nothing in uh, Q&A, it's our old- Okay. Uh, let me just double check really quickly. Yeah, it but... seems we're good. Yeah, All right. we're good. Cool, yeah. that's great because we've got a lot of content. So the the next one that we're going to talk about is an XML external entity expansion. So this one, um, here's an XML file. Maybe it's been a while since you've seen XML or maybe you have to deal with it all the time. Uh, and what is the problem here? I'll give you a minute to parse it. So you might, you might come away from this and say, well, look, uh, the problem here is that we're using XML. You know, there are some languages that can be read by humans, not by machines. Others can be read by machines and not by humans. XML solves this problem by being readable to neither. <laughs> and you would be right, but uh, what you're looking at is the fourth line where entity XXC system file colon slash 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 XC password exists. And basically what, what goes on here is that we, if you serve this file from your uh, you know, like web app, when you loaded that file from the disk, certain XML libraries will actually just insert the contents of this you know, arbitrary file from your system inside it. So if you have a file where you put some values in there that were controlled by the user and the user put in this like entity XXE thing, then when the server serves it back to them, it will suddenly slurp any possible file, you know, like potentially sensitive from your server. And in fact, you can tell from the existence of that file colon slash slash URL that it might not even be a local file. It could be something across the network. So you could use this to do like port scanning, for instance. Um, so this is kind of bad. Uh, unfortunately, uh, two out of the five Python built-ins in Python 2 for XML parsing were vulnerable to XML to external entity expansion. So on the left chart here, we have the docs for Python 2. The good news is it was fixed in Python 3 by default, uh, so it's safe, uh, at least for external entity expansion. 
but it turns out there's some other vulnerabilities which have to do with denial of service. Basically, if somebody uploads a very small XML file, it's possible for them to construct it in a way that makes it suddenly just grind your server to a halt trying to uh, you know, parse that XML file. And by default, Python libraries across all versions are vulnerable to the sorts of denial of service attacks. Uh, so that's not great. What are the recommendations? Well, the first one is maybe don't use XML, uh, but if you're using XML, you might not have a choice. So the second recommendation would be, well, we should just disable this XXE nonsense. Unfortunately, as far as I can tell, none of the Python built on libraries have any configuration that allows you to just disable these sorts of features. So actually the recommendation, uh, and if you look at the Python docs, this library is explicitly mentioned, is to just use a different library altogether. So there's a library called diffused XML. Uh, it is a drop-in replacement for LXML. And then basically you would want to make sure that if your application parses XML data that could be controlled by the user, you should definitely be using this and you should automatically check to make sure that you're not using any of the vulnerable libraries. Uh, so here, Bento can do that. There's another cool tool called the DLint, uh, which is a bunch of Flake 8 plugins. Uh, and so you can specifically subset and select those sorts of things uh, to enforce it. So we have uh, two more OWASP top 10 issues left to cover. We've talked about injection, we've talked about XXE. These are actually ordered by how frequent they are in terms of how often do people get hacked. Uh, so I really like number six though, because it is um, very high leverage from the perspective of an attacker. So this is security misconfiguration. And we've got an expansion here to our app.py file. We've added just a couple of lines. Uh, and there is actually at least one problem in this application, which you may have already identified. So this app.secret key is being set to a development key, not something from the environment or something with a, a bunch of, you know, like that was randomly generated. Um, not great. So, you know, like th that potentially compromises the secrecy of uh, things like cookies or the session. The other thing which is really subtle is that app.debug equals true. Yep, so I see Peter has already figured that out uh, in the chat. This is an incredibly high leverage. If you wanna get hacked in a single line of code, here's how you could do it. Uh, in fact, in 2015, uh, it's alleged that this is exactly how Patreon got hacked. Uh, and the, the great uh, feature with debug equals true is that when an error page pops up for your application, so your application sends an error code 500, the default view that comes, you know, uh, that, that comes up allows anybody to enter arbitrary Python code which you know, is useful to diagnose because you can just like get the stack trace, you can start to diagnose the problem, but suddenly it allows anybody to just like edit the code of your application effectively, right? Like they can just execute whatever code they want inside that shell. Um, and this is just not great, right? Like here's one line of code which just completely compromises the security of your application, uh, which is why attackers love security misconfiguration. And unfortunately, you know, in terms of how you prevent this, there's not a lot of good options. Uh, you know, my number one recommendation is, look, you just have to read the documentation for your framework and you have to pay attention to these notes that are going to be little call out caveats. Um, here's an example from the Python 3.7 docs that, you know, it's not big text in the original document. Uh, I highlighted security for this screenshot. Um, basically, the intuition here is if the attacker has a better understanding of the nuances of your framework than you do, you're going to have a bad time. But um, you know, it's, it's probably unrealistic to expect everybody in your company or team to be an expert in the framework. So one thing that a lot of teams do is they'll use a code owner's file, which is a feature on um, both GitHub and GitLab, which basically lets you say, hey, whenever this file is changed, I want these people to be tagged as mandatory reviewers. So if you can move your like conf.py uh, file out, then you can tag the people who are experts in Flask, for instance, and say, hey, like, yeah, they should definitely take a look at any kind of uh, change that happens to this uh, application. And to answer the question in the chat about the other, you know, like vulnerability, the like the secret key, you definitely want to basically inject the secret key from the environment. So a general best practice is, you know, if your application source code leaks, there shouldn't be any secrets or anything inside the application source code that's like checked in to Git, uh, which are secret. So it's much better to have like, you know, like in your running environment, 
it fetch it from the environment variable uh, or like inject it in some other way. Um, and then again, you know, like another helpful thing, the last recommendation here is as much as you can find lists of these gotchas that are misconfiguration specific, uh, automate finding them as much as possible. So the seventh one we're gonna talk about is cross-site scripting. And this is something that has really become kind of endemic uh, in the web, unfortunately. So much so that as we're gonna see in a little bit, the browser uh, you know, developers have actually included specific features because it's been so hard to eradicate this issue. So here we've got a Flask template file, Jinja template, uh, welcome to my website, app name, and then a form where I can put in some value and we're providing a default for that value from the server side. Uh, so again, this looks pretty innocent. Uh, what's the problem with this? Boom. Yes, so uh, another correct answer in the chat. What if the value equals a click handler, which is allowed to execute JavaScript? So like on mouse over equals alert. Uh, we could pop up a little box that would say XSS plus the contents of the user's cookie. If we were actually an attacker, rather than just a pop up, we would make a you know asynchronous uh, request to just send this off to some remote you know evilserver.com. So this is this is very very unhappy. Um, and the the crazy thing here, I think, is that if app name equals this, it's actually totally safe. Uh, so the context inside the HTML file matters, and like some contexts are safe, and some contexts are not. Um, so again, you know, coming back to the whole like, oh, you got to read the documentation. By default, Flask configures Jinja2 to automatically escape all values. So that's why here, this like app name is totally fine. That makes sense. That's great. Uh, but there are some caveats. So you know, like this thing at the bottom, very important are unquoted attributes. The attributes are not going to be automatically escaped in the Jinja templating. Very subtle. Um, and just to, you know, here's, here's yet another example of a, a gotcha inside the framework, I think, very, very subtle. And just to expand on that, there are actually other places where there are sort of exceptions to this default protection that you get from the framework. So for instance, one of the ones that actually bit our team and we wrote a blog post about uh, a few weeks ago is that if you have a template that ends in .html, .htm, .xml, .xhtml, then you automatically get auto escaping. But if you were serving a like .html2, or you had decided to like change the extension to something else other than these four values, suddenly the autoscaping is just disabled. Um, so that that is another example of a gotcha, right? Like the user can, anytime that we see JavaScript flowing from a potentially user supplied value into something where this escaping is not enabled, the possibility of cross-site scripting exists. Um, and the, just to make this really concrete, so here's an example with like render template, uh, which was one of the other caveats on this thing versus render template string. So imagine we've got app.route slash safe in our safe function, we're rendering safe.html, great. We are you know, like echoing back the request args, whatever is in this hello parameter to the user. So in this case, you know, somebody put in this URL, but this was not actually interpreted as JavaScript. It was just literally displayed on the page. That's what we want. But if we render with unsafe.txt, for instance, that we were hoping to serve up to the user, suddenly this is actually going to just like pop up uh, a box, which means that rather than it be inter interpreted as HTML, it was interpreted as JavaScript. Um, any, any questions about uh, you know, sort of the mechanics behind XSS and some of these um, gotchas slash holes in the uh, Flask setup? Cool, doesn't look like there are any, but that uh, gave me a chance to take a drink. So just to summarize this, the good news, Flask is configured to autoscape most views, but there's some gotchas, if your template files are being served without an HTML or a few other safe extensions, you're gonna be in trouble. HTML attributes have to be quoted uh, and using template variables for href and anchor tags is unsafe. So a couple more gotchas here. Now we're gonna talk about the recommendations for this. It's going to be a little bit uh, more subtle. So to Christian's question, adding form elements via JavaScript, that can also be unsafe depending on the sources of the data um, 
it depends on whether user supplied data is uh, you know, like being used to create those form elements. We're actually later on going to talk about some of the recommendations around secure frameworks because there are some frameworks that make it much harder to cause XSS and other frameworks that make it much easier. Because XSS has been such a difficult like issue to eradicate, uh, you know, as you can see, it's very subtle to know, oh, well, is this safe? Is this not safe? The browsers have actually started to add features that will allow you to just turn off a lot of the ways in which you can run JavaScript from the page. So the content security policy is a header that your server sends back to the client. Here are some examples. It's actually not just restricted to JavaScript. You could use it to block all images. You could use it to block uh, scripts served by anybody other than your domain. Uh, you could use it to block YouTube videos, things like that. So this is a very, very powerful tool. Um, if you're getting started with it, pretty much every fault source policy. So this, if you send this header is basically going to block everything except resources that are loaded from your application. Uh, so by default, that's going to disable Hey, can you guys still hear me? We can hear you now, yeah. Yeah, we can hear you now. My, uh, my headphones just died, unfortunately, so. Oh. <laughs> All right, and the presentation's still running? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. I just see uh, your- Yeah, your yeah. screen is not on. Gotcha. I will switch right back to it. All right, that all good? You're back. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I was just explaining that by default, that policy that we just showed on the previous screen is going to disable inline scripts, uh, which we just saw how those can be leveraged, the inline event handlers, uh, eval, which is a way to just execute arbitrary JavaScript and is another like great example of injection. So really, um, to be honest, like in most front end frameworks, these things are unnecessary. There are much safer ways uh, to handle these sorts of things. But if you have to use these sorts of features on the front end, uh, you can combine the policy with other tags like unsafe inline, unsafe hashes, unsafe eval to enable it. Uh, there's in fact a much better way, which is to whitelist specific resources. So if you're serving JavaScript from the server, you can actually say, hey, this is a specific hash that I only want you to execute a .js file, which matches this specific hash that came from uh, you know, the, uh, the server. So now you are explicitly creating a white list of code that is allowed and the attacker code is not going to be on that list. So this is a great, uh, great idea. Um, in fact, there, it's such a great idea that actually a number of these things were incorporated into a Google framework. So the Google Cloud folks created a toolkit called Flask Talisman which actually covers uh, a bunch of the things that we've talked about tonight, as well as a couple of other things that we didn't have time to talk about. But if you enable this in your Flask application, by default, it for forces connections to be uh, HTTPS. It enables strict transport security. It sets some flags on the session cookies, which are really valuable, which we didn't have time to talk about. And it sets the content security policy. So this is great, bang for your buck. Google made this because they were concerned about the Flask defaults. So I would highly recommend checking it out. The general recommendations though are, um, first off, if you can, you know, if you have a choice on a new project, use a front end framework, which is less vulnerable to XSS. Um, so, you know, everybody has opinions here. My, my personal recommendation, knowing a lot of people on the Facebook security team, I think that react.js actually does a much better job than other frameworks like Angular and Vue at making this, making XSS hard out of the box. Uh, in fact, it's even a little bit difficult to appreciate, but one of the design goals of React was because Facebook had had so many XSS issues in the past to make them uh, much more difficult. There's a point later on in the presentation we'll talk about some of the specifics around this. Um, the second recommendation, we already talked about this, but just do a quick check to make sure that anywhere you're calling the render template, you're using .html so that you don't suddenly and unexpectedly turn off the auto escaping. Uh, you know, if you're serving a .txt file through the render template and you're not setting the content type to HTML, you're fine. Uh, but you know, why would you be doing that exactly with the Jinja templating? You should be careful. Uh, third recommendation, which we talked about already, use the content security policy. And then the fourth one, 
Fast Talisman is really easy to use. You can see exactly how you would set it up in this snippet. Uh, and then automatically enforce one or more or of the above. Uh, you know, so there are automated tools that you can use to check that you're uh, setting a content security policy, for instance, dynamically. Uh, and later on in the presentation, we'll talk about how to do some of these other things statically. So any questions on the XSS side of things? Cool. All right, so one last one uh, for anybody who's used the pickle module, it's a great example of the eighth item on that OWASP checklist, which is insecure deserialization. So here again is another fairly straightforward code example. We're using pickle.load to load up some prep file from the user and then we're returning a JSON of it. And then when it comes back, uh, you know, we're saving the user preferences to a pickle file. So this again, seems pretty straightforward. What's the problem here? Well, if you had looked at the docs, uh, you would have seen a note about pickle, which would have said, hey, pickle is not safe to open any kind of data provided by the user. So if the user provided data happens to look like this, sort of arcane incantation, what's actually going to go on is that if you load this on your server, your server will make a reverse shell uh, to evilserver.com. So it'll basically be as if the owner of evilserver.com has SSH'd uh, shell access directly into your web server. Um, and in fact, this is such a common thing that there is actually a payload generator for this in Metasploit, which is one of the most popular offensive hacking frameworks. Um, unfortunately, this is a problem for many other formats. Uh, so PyYAML, for instance, until the most recent version, I believe, the dot load function on PyYAML, if a user can control you know, what is going on there, is vulnerable to the same sort of thing. And it's just because you know, oftentimes this is a feature. Like it's very, very handy to be able to say, oh yeah, like, um, you know, I would actually like to reinstantiate a object with all of its methods and code, uh, but it's something that can be exploited by an attacker. So there's more, unfortunately. We've, we've talked about the, uh, you know, OWASP top 10 for web apps, uh, which is what Flask uh, certainly qualifies as, but you might be using Flask or Django and you might have been sort of like laughing along I mean, like ah, all this XML, HTML stuff, all I do is I bring in JSON and I send JSON out. I'm a true API. Well, in fact, OWASP has a top 10 list for APIs, uh, which has a whole different set of things. We're not gonna have time to talk about that tonight. Some of the ones that I find the most interesting are mass assignment and open redirects. Uh, if you Google for those, you'll find some more details about it, or you can chat with me after the, uh, the presentation. So basically what we've established is that trying to secure our innocent looking Python app.py uh, is a world full of gotchas. And at this point, you might be kind of tempted to just throw in the towel on you know, making things secure and robust altogether. But I have some good news. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna do is just filter down what are the things that we even need to care about in the first place. And then the second thing that we're gonna do, the fourth part of the presentation is going to be about what kind of automated tools are there to help me out. So if you were to hire a security person to come in, they would basically say, okay, what you need to do first to understand risk is to assess probability versus impact. So for instance, that like CSV injection thing, maybe moderate, moderate impact, but really unlikely on the product probability spectrum. So we're gonna rate that as low. But if you've seen something that you're like, oh wow, like we probably do have some templates we're rendering without like a .html, .xhtml extension, uh, that could be pretty bad for the security of the application. So it's something that you would grade as critical. And what I would just remind you of is that, you know, human nature says, given a list of mitigations, by nature, we try to pick the things that are the easiest, not the most effective. Uh, you know, so like this is on full display with all the viral situation going on, right? Like given the choice between, oh, wash your hands more and don't leave your house, most people are going to opt for wash your hands more, even though it's significantly less effective than the other. Um, so as we, as we talk about the recommendations, just bear in mind that there can be really disproportionate impacts to some of these recommendations in terms of their effectiveness versus others. So with that said, let's get into the uh, tools to automate security. And I'm, I should be on track to wrap up by uh, 40 minutes after the hour. So we've got about nine minutes left here. Um, there's, there's a bunch of different tools that we could imagine using. 
So at the extreme end, there are formal methods, which are like you know, very principled mathematical ways to prove that our application is secure. At the extreme other end, we might say, hey, we just don't care about this at all. We're gonna put it up there and let people poke at it and we'll pay them to report the vulnerabilities that they find to us, uh, which is exactly the intuition behind things like bug bounties. But since you know, we are Python language interested, we're gonna focus on secure by design languages and frameworks, as well as what can be done running code that analyzes Python code to tell us about the security properties of things. Uh, so Google just published a new edition of the SRE book uh, called Building Secure and Reliable Systems. Uh, and they, they are heavy believers in this idea that being able to address problems at the framework level is ideal. Because it means that if your framework author fixes this issue, then it's no longer an issue in any of the applications that that framework supports. Uh, and it can just make entire types of vulnerabilities like SQL injection become a non-issue. So if you were writing code at Google, you would not be allowed to use a SQL framework that allows SQL injection. So what, what is going on that makes some frameworks better than others? Uh, you know, coming back to that debug equals true example, if you run a Flask application like that, uh, and I think they've actually finally fixed it in the most recent versions of Flask. There's no like a pin or something. It's still not great. But the message that you get is don't do this in a production environment. What would be a better message would be the message, something that says, don't use this in a production environment or you will get hacked. Uh, that sort of gives you a sense of the impact. I think the best thing that a framework would do would basically be to say, hey, this is production ready by default, but you're running with this crazy scary flag so I'm going to let you do that, uh, but I'm not going to let you forget about it. So a bad example of this, if we pick on Flask, is this render template string versus render template, right? Pop quiz, which is the one that was bad? Uh, <laughs> it's really not obvious, just looking at the name of the function. And one of the cool things, very, very smart, that I think the React framework did was they re renamed the uh, inner HTML function, which allows you to like set arbitrary HTML as the contents of an element. So for the, for the person who was asking in the chat about adding form elements via JavaScript, you know, if you're using jQuery, you use that inner HTML, for instance. React renamed that to dangerously set inner HTML to emphasize, hey, this is a place where XSS can happen inside the application. Um, so that, that I think, you know, like is a clear view into, hey, some frameworks are better than others. Uh, the Google book that I mentioned actually has a whole table here which shows you the OWASP top 10 that we just talked about and what are the framework hardened measures that you can put along with those things to try to mitigate them. So I'd highly recommend that. And then to get specific, you know, to avoid SQL injection, SQL alchemy is not foolproof. We're actually working on a blog post with Jacob Kaplan Moss, who's one of the uh, co-authors of Django, specifically about SQL alchemy and just documenting the remaining sharp edges inside that, even if you're using it. Uh, XSS, React.js, but really, you know, like most modern frameworks do a decent job uh, over the like Jinja templates. Uh, Flask Talisman has some hardening for that. For the XML vulnerabilities that we talked about, uh, there's things like diffused XML. And then we didn't have time to talk about cross-site request forgery, uh, but a common way that people will try to mitigate that is through JSON web tokens. They have some caveats, but they're generally a lot better uh, than using cookies for authentication. Uh, any questions? Just a quick pause there on the framework side of things. Cool, well, there'll be uh, more time for questions at the end. And now we get into uh, the fun stuff. So, you know, tools that can look at your Python code and give you security recommendations. So probably the uh, oldest one on this list is Bandit. There's a newer one from Duo Security called Dlint. Uh, which is a bit more tuned uh, and it's also implemented as a Flake 8 plugin, so it's a little bit faster. Flake 8 doesn't have any security rules out of the box, uh, but there are some associated plugins for it that are pretty useful. Uh, and then, you know, as a shameless shout out for one of our own open source projects, Bento actually packages Bandit, Dlint, uh, some of the Flake 8 plugins, and about over 100 checks at this point that we at RTC have written. I'll show you some examples of those in a minute. Uh, and then, of course, there are a decent number of proprietary closed source things, Sonar Python, Coverity, Fortify, Veracode, checkmarks. To be honest, unfortunately, the commercial space for Python is a bit thin. Uh, you know, most people writing security sensitive code, it tends to be in Java or C++. So that's where a lot of those tools have spent most of their energy. Um, so the, the general intuition with these tools and 
uh, you know, don't worry, we'll be publishing the slides afterwards so you can go take a look at them from there, is the, like I mentioned before, being consistent is actually more important than anything else. So how can we just automate these sorts of prevention? Um, so this was originally designed for a PyCon as like a uh, tutorial where people could actually follow along, but we don't have time for that here. So here's, I'll just uh, give you it kind of as an illustrative example. Here's an example of that render template string. If we wanted to prevent somebody from committing code that included that, we could write a simple bash script, which we could then install as a Git hook, which would basically, anytime somebody tries to commit code that says render template string, echo out, hey, I found this, I'm blocking your commit. Uh, unless you explicitly skip this git commit hook. So that'd be great because we're now like explicitly, you know, obviously you would want to have some better messaging about why this is bad and whatnot. We could do a similar thing when it comes to like uh, looking for href uh, attributes on, site, on links that have, um, you know, template looking things inside them. Uh, so this will block anybody who's trying to commit code because uh, it will use grep to just detect anything that looks like href equals uh, curly brace, curly brace with some sort of content inside. So this is great. Um, the one caveat is that, well, okay, like you've eliminated just a couple patterns. You're still kind of playing whack-a-mole with all of these other categories. Um, and so we, we talked about these tools, but uh, the grep rules that we added are a good example. One thing that R2C has been working on, which is pretty cool, is a tool which was actually originally open sourced by Facebook uh, and we're now the maintainers of. So it's the engine for the custom checks that we do. I'll show you a quick example. It's basically like grep, but it actually understands the content of the code. So here we've got an actual application, flask, render template string. If we run this, uh, we'll see that this bit here with the dot, 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 it doesn't really care about what's inside this, uh, but it's aware of the AST. So if we you know, do some weird formatting things, multi-line, which would be kind of obnoxious in grep, it'll just handle all that for us automatically. And then what if we had somebody who used import aliasing, so they said, from Flask, import render template string as RTS. Well, now this would be very obnoxious to find with grep, uh, but because the sim grep tool is actually aware of some of the semantics of the language, it finds it no problem. Uh, so if you go to simgrep.live, there's some examples. Um, and just to show another thing uh, on that front, there's even some rules that I've written specifically for like Python 3.6 and Python 3.7 compatibility. So if you're upgrading your you know, Python or Flask app to a new version of Python and you want to make sure, hey, I'd like to be backwards compatible with Python 3.6, I would like to know if I'm accidentally using a Python 3.8 feature. Uh, you can use some of those rules to automatically trigger. So that's kind of cool. Um, but the general takeaways, so just, you know, coming back to this whole, hey, what's most effective? What's, what's actually the uh, things that might be hard but are most effective mitigations? Our first off, stay up to date on the dependencies in your stack, because that is where an attacker who comes in is always going to want to use something that they can use across many people rather than just you. Read the documentation for your framework. Uh, so both Flask and Django have security documentation. It's not that long. It's a good read. And then figure out a way to, you know, check your code with code. So, you know, doing it manually uh, or on each commit or push, uh, it's hard to go wrong with improving your setup and infrastructure there. So the last bit, uh, we would love your feedback on the presentation in terms of like pieces that you found useful, pieces that you didn't find useful, uh, whether you would have seen it, like been interested in a different area of those security things versus the one that we covered would uh, be super helpful for us. And with that, I am finished and open for questions. There's uh, one in the box here, uh, Isaac. I don't know if you can see this or not. It's from Christian. Can you read this one? Uh, I still can't see the Q&A ones. So okay, I'll, just, I'll read it out to you. It's also in the chat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, about the Rack Enforcer. At the Rack, Rack SSL, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So I'm not actually familiar with uh, like Rack Enforcer or Rack SSL, is that a like um, specific to a hosting provider? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah okay. Christian? Um, okay. So possibly, uh, like I'm not, I'm not familiar as much with like the Ruby ecosystem. I, I will say that like, Unfortunately, you know, like for instance, Cloudflare provides some level of XSS protection. Unfortunately, 
the best way to protect against XSS is to make these changes at the source code level, like the level that you're dealing with. There are things, you know, they'll basically look for, oh, it seems like somebody is putting a script tag inside this parameter. Uh, and then they'll try to automatically block it, you know, at the kind of like HTTP level. Unfortunately, a like motivated attacker, it's usually pretty easy to bypass those less fundamental defenses. So my personal take is that it's kind of a fool's errand to try to do it at the network level. And that, you know, setting things like the CSP, yeah, it's a good band-aid, but if you can get people to use a secure by default framework, it's a lot better. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Well, I'll be around in the chat, but I don't want to take any time away from uh, the next presenter. So thank you so much uh, for the audience. I would love to be in Calgary in person sometime, but uh, it'll have to wait. Oh, thanks so much, Isaac, for this very intuitive and informative presentation. Absolutely. Um, so for the audience, um, if you like this presentation and if you want to give some feedback, uh, Karen has posted a survey in the chat. Uh, it's go.bento.dev slash survey. So, um, you know, finish the survey and cheer it up. Also, um, a, a couple of months ago, I've made announcements to the meetups that the uh, Django has released two consecutive um, security releases for both Django 2 and 3. So if you are um, using Django, make sure you have those updated. Um, also for those who are just joined to the meeting, I have the, um, uh, there's a, a free draw for PyCharm license at the end of the uh, meetup today. And I've posted the, um, uh, the spreadsheet in the QA, so feel free to check it out. Now let's welcome uh, Revlin to give her presentation. Cool. I also, I, I was gonna interject here and just kick things off and sort of introduce Sequent, um, if that works for you, Revlin. Um, Perfect. Yeah, cool. So, so I'm, I'm Franklin and uh, Ravlin and I both work um, for Sequent, which is a, um, it's a geoscience software company. It's, there's about, it's an international company, about four or 500 people. Um, and there's a, the, our headquarters in, is in New Zealand, but we have an office here that has like 20 or 25 people in it. Um, and really like sort of our mission is uh, within the geoscience world is to um, is like complexity to clarity. So we take, we try to take complex information and through modeling and analysis and um, collaboration, make something useful and clear out of it. Um, and so we have a few, a few um, software packages like Leapfrog and Oasis Montage and GeoStudio. Uh, specifically what, what um, we do, Revly and I do at Sequent is we work on building web APIs. Um, and so I, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in a lot of the, the stuff Isaac was talking about in his talk, but kind of from, from the opposite side, less the security side and more like how to make it easier for users to, to interact with and sort of how to provide a nice developer user interface for our um, web applications. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, anyway, so I guess Revlin's been a software developer for five years and she joined my team about six months ago and that that's also when she started Python so she's a rel relative newcomer to Python um, yeah anyway I will stop talking and let you take over cool thank you hey everyone so I'm gonna share my screen now and here start with the presentation Revelyn, do you want questions uh, questions as they come in, or do you just want them at, at the end at certain points? Um, so as they come in, it uh, will be good, I think. Yeah, that would be more relevant to address sure. them right away. OK, perfect. Yeah, if I see some come in, I'll just uh, I'll unmute and, and read them out to you. OK, so um, my presentation is visible, I suppose. Full screen, I can see it. 
So hey everyone, we'll be uh, talking about a Python framework called Fast API and uh, how we can use it to build a dashboard web API in this hour. So, um, before I get started, um, uh, let me quickly tell you what would be the takeaway of the session. So there is a really nice uh, website called Ticketmaster, um, which lists uh, different um, concerts and events that happen around, around uh, North America, I suppose. So uh, in the end, we'll be uh, showing uh, an API that lists all the concerts or events uh, that, ha that are happening in a, in a particular city. Uh, so yeah, uh, in the end, you'll see and see a really nice and simple uh, API to list all the um, events that are happening in our city right now. Um, so the agenda would be, we'll be starting really basic from the terms what, uh, like what is an API and what is the um, web API and then uh, what is REST API. Then uh, I'll talk about what are the characteristics of a good API. Uh, after that, we'll move on to um, learning about what is a fast API and why do we use fast API. Uh, next will be, uh, I'll be comparing um, the other alternatives present in the market with Fast API. After that, how do we install Fast API? And then we'll move on to the really nice example uh, of the API that I just talked about. So, uh, okay, so let's get started. Um, what is an API? So an API is something which is always there behind the scenes and makes all the interactivity possible. So if, even a function in a programming language is an API. So basically what an API is, it's a messenger which takes a request from you and tells the system what you want to do and then returns response back to you. Um, so in, uh, in simple words, um, it is an interface which has a set of functions that allow us to access a specific object that could be specific feature or data um, or any other service. Uh, let's try to understand this with the help of an, uh, of an analogy. Um, consider a coffee machine as a system, they, uh, having a various buttons on it to select different kinds of coffees. So these buttons could be uh, taken as an interface. Um, so if I want uh, to have a certain kind of coffee, all I need to do is I need to click the button and I do not care about the complexity of how the coffee is made, how, uh, how much is the measure of the um, water, how much milk is required, and all the complexity is hidden from me. So, um, all I need to do is have an interface in between so that um, I do not care about the complexity. So these are the primary benefits of an API that it hides the, uh, it hides the implementation um, and provides a standard way of accessing a system. So next we'll move on. Um, oh yeah. Then um, an API can be categorized on the basis of technologies used and um, the level of abstraction. So here, this picture uh, shows a simple classification of APIs. Um, uh, from here, we are more interested in web service APIs. Um, so let's move on to web API. What's, uh, what, is it? what is a web API? Um, it, it is an interface where the communication happens over the internet and we use HTTP protocol to exchange the information. So the, uh, this involves um, a request that is made to the endpoints that are made available um, by a service um, and we get a response um, in back. So these um, response and re request structures um, can be uh, in the data format, um, can, can be uh, in JSON or XML data format. Next, uh, we can, there are different architectures and protocols that can be used uh, to create a web API. 
they are SOAP, JSON RPC, and XML RPC, which are used uh, lesser these days. And then uh, the most popular out of all is REST. We'll be talking about the REST um, API. Um, so, um, yeah. Nowadays, when you hear someone talk about web API, they are usually referring to REST API. Uh, because of its po uh, popularity, is the REST is um, uh, very flexible. So if you implement if you implement the hypermedia correctly, uh, you can um, you can give out the data in different formats, and there could be multiple types of calls uh, to get that data. Now, an, uh, for an API to be uh, uh, to be REST API, there are certain principles that it has to follow. So the first one is client-server architecture. Um, there should be um, a client that asks for uh, some resource from the server. So this is what um, and this is what a client-server architecture means. Next is stateless. Um, uh, for in REST API, there isn't any client context stored on the server between the request. So request will have everything, uh, all the information that is um, that is required to get a response back. There isn't any uh, thing stored or any context stored on the server. Next is cacheable. The clients can cache the responses. Um, so the, uh, the REST API should explicitly uh, state that whether the response can be cached or not. Next is layered system. The, um, the client-server interactions can be mediated by additional layers. So these additional layers could offer additional features like load balancing, shared caches, or security. Next is uniform interface. Um, uh, here, the so the key is to decouple the client and the server um, uh, and having a uniform interface that allows independent evolution of the application without having the um, without um, having application server uh, services models or actions tightly coupled to the API layer itself so that um, the client and the server can um, uh, any uh, can evolve independently and there aren't any um, uh, and the changes uh, in either of them do not affect the other. So now, uh, what are the key char the characteristics of a good API? There are a bunch of characteristics of a good API, but uh, uh, for the scope of this presentation, I'll be just talking about three of them. First is documentation. Uh, the documentation is uh, and API documentation is extremely, um, extremely important. Um, documentation is crucial to acceptance by working developers. So no or poor documentation can make it tedious for a developer to learn about it. So a documentation should always cover um, what the data set is, why the data set is important, what is the structure, uh, of a request message and a response message, um, and how to use that API, and also uh, some interactive uh, examples. Next is uh, error. Uh, next is errors. Um, uh, when we are building an application, it is necessary to think about all the mistakes uh, people can make when learning to use your API. So there should never be a time a developer should see a 500. Uh, so the key is to, uh, to report back appropriate error codes uh, and also uh, human readable messages. Next is consistency. Developers uh, want an easy life. When they call your API, they want to be able to predict what will happen and what will be the expected um, response. So there, this is, so it is essential to have a consistency 
uh, across the structure uh, of the response and the request and maintain a consistency in the vocabulary that you use in your API. So next, let's move on to what is a fast API. A fast API is um, a micro framework, uh, just, like, just like Flask, and it is very intuitive. The routing system is similar to Flask. Um, it is it is as it is same as you uh, define a route in a Flask API. Uh, the Fast API provides data validation by using um, type annotations uh, uh, from Python three. Um, Fast API uh, also supports uh, async um, and await uh, calls to the methods. So it, it makes it makes a, uh, development of asynchronous APIs easily easy. Uh, Fast API also generates uh, API documentation automatically uh, by using Open API and the JSON schemas. Um, next is uh, uh, you can see the documentation link and the source code link here. Um, for the Fast API. So why do we use Fast API? Uh, first is auto documentation. Uh, as we are writing code, we define, uh, we write the doc strings. Uh, so Fast API collates uh, these doc strings, uh, doc strings and converts them into a documentation using Open API. Um, and also you can define the schema uh, that will be part of the documentation automatically. The FAST API is built on top of Starlet, which is, um, which is an uh, ASGI framework that supports async and uh, update support and makes FAST API very responsive. It says as uh, FastAPI is based on PyDentic, uh, uh, all the data validation happens under the hood. Um, so a Py, a PyDentic will raise a validation error if it finds uh, an invalid input and uh, will, and the FastAPI will give out a 422 error code, which says a uh, validation error. So uh, next is, uh, is Fast API is 100% uh, type annotated, uh, which means we, uh, the auto completion is in place and you do not uh, need to write everything on your own, and um, which, is, which is great. Um, next is uh, as Fast API is um, built on top of already existing tools and uh, frameworks, there isn't anything new to learn on it. Uh, it is just a standard modern Python. So uh, we'll be comparing now um, a Flask API with the Fast API. Flask requires uh, other uh, libraries and extensions to implement certain features which are made easy by the Fast API. Fast API is uh, a batteries included framework. Uh, you do not need different um, uh, tools to do certain uh, certain kind of work. The Flask uh, is Flask is uh, blocking by default. That means if um, if a work uh, the work triggered by a request to a particular endpoint will hold the server entirely until that request is complete. Whereas Fast API is non-blocking as uh, it it runs on an, an asynchronous event loop. Um, next is uh, in Fast API, the data validation and error handling is simple. We uh, only define the parameters to the function and then uh, the uh, data validation happens under the hood. Whereas in Flask API, we usually 
uh, deal with the data uh, with the data validation um, explicitly by using try catch blocks. So here um, is a place where uh, fast APIs uh, data validation uh, makes uh, makes everything simple. Um, Hello. Am I, yes. am I audible? Yep, yep, I can hear you all right. Okay, cool. And my, um, you can see my screen, right? Yep, everything's fine. Cool. Um, so as we're writing an application in Flask, um, we are writing the doc strings. Uh, so for documentation, we would need a, a different tool that would create uh, the doc strings into documentation. Whereas in fast API, um, when we hit a docs URL, we will uh, we'll see the documentation, which is based on open API. Next is um, Django versus fast API. Um, Django is uh, is a complete a complete web framework, and um, it is relatively tightly coupled with the relational database. Basis. And if you need to uh, use a no SQL database, then it is pretty hard. Uh, whereas with Fast API, it supports um, uh, relational and uh, no SQL databases very well. Um, so, uh, uh, by default, ORM is included even if uh, you are not using uh, relational databases in Django. Um, whereas in Fast API, there isn't anything like that. If you do not need, uh, if you are not using relational database, um, you need not have ORM. Uh, okay, Basically, uh, Django was created to generate HTML uh, in the backend, not to create APIs. Uh, um, by this, by uh, not uh, sorry, not to create APIs by the other systems. Uh, whereas um, Fast APIs um, main motive is uh, to create REST APIs. Uh, so Django provides uh, another framework called Django REST Framework Package, uh, which is used for REST APIs, which it comes with a ton of features, but then it lacks um, uh, open API documentation generation, which is, uh, which is one of the highlights of the FAST API. Uh, to get the fast API, uh, if you need, uh, if you want all the optional dependencies and features, you can uh, run pip install fast API all. If you need, if you want to install uh, it part by part, you can um, run pip install API. If, uh, sorry, pip install fast API, and then you would need uh, an ASGS server called Uricorn to install. Um, to install Uricorn, you will. Have to run the install Uricorn. Now let's see uh, uh, the example of a fast API. I'll be moving on to my code here. So here's, uh, here's an app. Uh, okay. Here I'm, uh, uh, I'm instantiating a fast API and giving uh, a little description about the API. Uh, next, I am here, I am defining all the models uh, which I'll be using in my app. Um, so the response model is the response, uh, um, is, defines the structure of the response that this API gives. Um, Next uh, is uh, app.getDecorator, which marks my function, gets the events. Um, um, so here I am um, defining the response model. Uh, 
So here I'm telling that response model uh, is the uh, is the class that is um, giving structure to the response. There are various responses uh, which can be listed here. And this would be the uh, structure of the response. Next in the function, um, so uh, we can we can define We can define all the query parameters in as parameters of this function. Uh, so the first uh, parameter would be API key, which is the API key to Ticketmaster API. Um, and then uh, is, is the city. Uh, so this is the uh, um, parameter that tells uh, in which city we want to uh, know the events. Next is postal code. Uh, we get filter the um, list of the events on the basis of postal code as well. Um, so the next is a search ID. Uh, we'll be uh, using this to demonstrate uh, a validation error. It does not have to do anything else with the API. Um, and also, uh, if you have noticed here, you would see uh, the types uh, by the parameters. So um, this helps um, fast API to figure out what would be the valid um, input. Um, then moving on to uh, the function, this will uh, this function returns me um, uh, the response from the ticket uh, mastery API. Um, so if I get a 401, which is uh, an invalid API key, I return the error. Otherwise, I will uh, construct my response um, and then return the response so in the end, uh, here uh, I'm running a UVCoin uh, server on um, local uh, with port 880. So now let's see um, the documentation. So here when I hit okay, host 880 and click on docs, so the, doc, the docs are automatically generated. We, uh, I see all the schemas that I've listed here, whether it's response model, it tells me the structure of uh, the response, so there will be links and then events, um, and then it tells me about the structure of the validation error um, and all the fields that will be uh, in the validation error, but then there is a uh, structure of the link schema. Um, there is HTTP validation error, and also uh, it tells me even if uh, what will be the structure of an event. Uh, so uh, here is the method uh, that this API exposes, and these are all the parameters um, that this API takes. So here uh, we uh, we can see that. Uh, API key is required and the city is required, uh, which is marked by itself when we define here that I, this is um, uh, the API key is required uh, and then city is required. If uh, a parameter is not uh, mandatory, then we can uh, say none uh, in the specification. Um, so let's try it out here. If I click on try it out and then I need an API key here. So let me grab an API key from here. So let's see what are the events happening in Calgary. And I click on execute. Oops, sorry, I need to get the API key and not the link. Okay. Yes. Hmm. 
So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try it right here in Postman. Sorry, guys, my mask is not working properly. I think you can right click on the column and uh, do a copy there. Uh, yeah, that's good. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, so here, click on execute. And I see a nice list of all the events. Um, uh, so here, the structure of the event is similar with, uh, as it is given here. And also, let's see a validation error. So if I give, uh, so the search ID is supposed to be an integer if I give a string it does not let me execute. It says that it has to be an integer. For this, we will try to make a request here. We're starting to push them again. I think we're approaching the end. If people have questions, we could start on those, possibly. Yeah, we can we can take the questions and then yeah. um, if this works, we can show you the validation error that pops up. Um, yeah. So. Um, Next, uh, these are the resources and uh, for the readings uh, uh, about the topics that we discussed in the presentation. Um, yeah, that's, that's all from my side. Any questions that you guys have? Actually, just out of curiosity, do you guys use uh, this fast API in production? Yes, we do. Nice. So uh, Alex is asking, how do you usually test your API? Uh, we, we are using PyTest uh, for unit testing, uh, for testing our APIs. Um, other than that, we are uh, using um, um, a tool called Locust for load balance, uh, for um, testing, uh, load testing. <clears throat> 
Yeah, I think the, the only thing that comes with... So Fast API is built on top of Starlet. And so Starlet has like a test client, which is similar to something Flask has. Um, so we make use of that. But then beyond that, it's mostly... Uh, there, there isn't much tooling around it other than just sort of the standard tools for testing Python, Python async. Cool, thanks. Um, just wanted, do you know how Fast a, uh, API enforces the uh, type checking? So it is based on uh, 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 another library called Pydantic. Uh, so it's the Pydantic that um, um, handles all the type checking. Um, if, if a data is not valid, it, um, it says that uh, it gives out a validation error and then uh, fast API uh, handles that error and returns uh, uh, 422. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. So do we have more questions? All right, seems like that's it. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining us and thank, um, thank you, Raylan and uh, Isaac for giving the wonderful presentations. Um, so our next one is May uh, 27th. So mark your calendar and um, Hopefully I'll see you all there. Um, if you want to particip participate in the draw, just um, stay for a little longer. I'll share my screen to do a live draw. And other than that- um, That way we can see it's, uh, it's a real draw. Yeah, it's a real draw, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, other than that, uh, thanks so much for coming and have a wonderful night and uh, stay safe and healthy. Bye.